My name is Richie Beltran. I'm Rumson and Selena Maloney. Uh, I'm still trying to find out. I think Chichateca and Seneca, and uh, European and African. And I say this, I introduce myself um, first and foremost to the ancestors here, um, you know, and then of course to everybody here, um, but to the ancestors, the Aswaswas, um, Aswaswas uh, band of the Ohlone, this is their territory, and I, and I ask permission to be here in a good way um, from, uh, from my area, from my part of uh, Ohlone territory. Thank you, ancestors, for letting us be here and occupy this space on sacred grounds. Um, you know, all of Mother Earth is sacred grounds. And um, <clears throat> when we honor it in that way, it helps us to have that compassion and that, that sensitivity to acknowledge um, important things like, like Mauna Kea, um, you know, and the people who love Mauna Kea and um, their struggles right now. So, um, First, I want, I want to offer a song to the ancestors right now to show my love, show my appreciation for letting us be here right now in, in this good way. Uh, I thank everybody for coming. They're only here because of the sacrifices that were made. Um, we can only imagine the sacrifices that were made so these songs could be alive today for us to be honored enough to be able to sing them. So I'm going to offer a song of, from, from, from my area, from, Rums, from the Rumson territory. We are the people of the, of the, of the mountain, um, Mount Umaya up there. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to sing a song to honor, we sang that song yesterday, we may sing that song again today. I'm just feeling the call to sing the song of the spirit of the land, to honor the spirit of the land where we're at, the spirit of the people, the spirit of the ancestors, the spirit of the descendants that are right here in this space. So wa to wa to wa yen mo wa to wa to wa to wa yen mo wa i zen ne jo so ya ma da do da to wa to wa to wa yen mo wa to wa to wa to wa yen mo wa Eden Many blessings to all my relations. I am um, so glad to be standing here with, with my sister and other sister and my uncle, you know, in solidarity. You know, what, what comes to me that's really important is you know for 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 those that need to understand the importance of this is to embrace the history embrace the full history that happened here you know i've, I've heard some people say it was a long time ago you know this is now or it, well it wasn't a long time ago it was not that long ago and it's still happening today the re the, the fact that we have to protect our sacred sites our burial grounds places that our ancestors have done ceremony at for thousands of years that are our traditional lands, Mauna Kea, you know, Mount Umuya, um, Sagorate, our burial ground that we stood, stood, stood ground for for 109 days to protect it so that they wouldn't remove more of the ancestors. They removed some of the ancestors there already and are in, in um, storage boxes in the basement of Berkeley. Um, that's our burial ground, that's our ancestors, that's our people. 
they need to be brought back to the land and, and brought back home again. So it's still the struggles of today. Um, you know, these struggles, just speaking here, um, you know, my grandmother, she, she, she told us that we were Spanish for, for years because that was, she chose that path. She didn't protect us. In her day, it was still unsafe to acknowledge her indigenous roots because it was still legal to enslave native peoples here in California. I don't know about over there. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's so much of it's the same all across, all across Turtle Island and, and you know, all the islands. Um, but it was still legal to enslave indigenous peoples here when my grandmother was alive under the, the, uh, the guise of indentured servant. You know, you could say that this person who's less than human because they have not embraced Catholicism or whatever it was, however they gauged it through the doctrine of discovery. I mean, if you do, if you take nothing else, <clears throat> you know, research the doctrine of discovery if you haven't already done it and, and, and look at that, that was how, um, that was how the land was taken from the people here and in so many places. And it was, like I said, it was still legal to, to enslave native peoples, indigenous peoples of California, even into, I think it was the 1920s and the 1930s, possibly. Um, you know, you could just say they crossed my land. They, 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 they um, you know, illegally crossed my land, and so therefore they trespassed, so now they become your indentured servant for whatever time the court said it was legal to do. Um, the rights, you know, from what I understand, for indigenous peoples to embrace and do our ceremonies wasn't legalized until the 70s. So, you know, this is a reemergence of cultures. You know, cultures have been, been hidden. That's why I say the songs, the, the sacrifices that were made so these songs could still be here, the language could still be here. They did that for a reason, so they could be reemerged now. They had to hide it. You know, I, I learned of a dress, a ceremonial dress that was buried in the missions. It was our ancestors. They were, they were enslaved to build the missions, and they buried this ceremonial dress. They would have never have thought to do that. The only reason they did that was to save that dress so it could be brought back out of it and brought back in the ceremony. It's the wish of the ancestors. It's the will of the ancestors to protect these sacred ground. It's the will of the people that are here now to honor the ancestors, to protect these special places. And, um, so only with really fully understanding the history and the present and how it, it, it all comes to place now to really, really fully understand with an empathetic heart and spirit how important these sacred places are. How important these sacred places are and um, how important it is to honor the, 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 the will of indigenous peoples in protecting these, these sacred places. So, um, yeah, with, with that, I, I just... I'm, I'm thankful to be here standing, standing with you in solidarity and peace and love and my spirit. And I thank everybody for being here. This is this is beautiful, beautiful circle to be a part of. We are all Earth people. We're all indigenous and not hers. And we're all of the same tribe. And it's an honor to be a part of all of you. So, oh, uh, oh. Thank you. We came here to, with a specific mission without a doubt. And that mission was to speak to the thought leaders of the TMT, to ask them to consider doing something different. And what that is is to join with the indigenous people, you know, because Rather, if you're coming from indigenous science or modern science, both agree that we have a problem on Earth that requires us to do better in the world, to live in a punoe. So I don't want you to mistake that we are coming here because we're against anything, it is that we are for Mauna Kea. Sacred sites are important everywhere, and they're important primarily because they hold the biodiversity of the planet there. So most of the animals, plants, bugs, uh, and life on Mauna Kea 
are either rare, threatened, or endangered. So frustrating any of their ability to survive is unacceptable and, and to be in balance at the same time. They cannot coexist in that way. Also, Mauna Kea is the principal aquifer for Hawaii Island. That's the big island of Hawaii um, where Mauna Kea is. But it's also the pinnacle um, of the Pacific. It's a sacred place to not only Hawaiians, but throughout Polynesia. And the reason is, is because it stands highest from the bottom of the ocean to its top. It, um, it's our place where we conduct the ceremonies, which are, I think, referred to now as the procession, of what's known as the procession of the equinox, uh, which most um, cultures, I think all cultures, celebrated, uh, valued. Um, and that's because it kept time. Not the time we live under now, but the universe, universe time, the, the way of the universe that we live in, not empire. The time we live under now is the time of empire. And we're in, in 2012, which was a significant time uh, and prophecy, and the cultures had prophecy, we too had this prophecy. So when that happened, we completed a huge cycle we're now progressing into this new cycle. But we need to also change how empire operates now because it's no longer time of empire. It's time of, of nature. It's time of Earth Mother, Sky Father. Earth Mother is what is calling out to us now. Earth Mother is um, it wasn't political organizing that, that, that caused the kia'i, the protectors, to go up on the kea. It was Earth Mother, Keakua, called to them in their heart. You know, it wasn't because we all went and gave talks and da 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 da. No, there was no plan. When you get the call, show up. Please don't give a hand it back to you. When the earth is calling out to you, you're going to know it. You will know it. And I'll tell you a short story from a brother who I saw recently. And I asked him this question. I said, brother, how are you? And he said, I'm good. And I said, I want to ask you this question. What was it who landed on the stake? So he, he couldn't hit it. So he's old. OK, so just move to the next one. He cranked up, he went to hit it. The dragonfly flew to the next one. And he said, oh, OK, if he does it a third time, I'm out, right? <laughs> so he did it again, and it flew to the third one. He threw down his thing, and he said, whoa, like that. And his boss said, what you doing? And he said, boss, I got to go. I'm out of here. So his boss just sensed that something was not, you know, like he needed to go. So he said, OK, go, go. He went home and that was, he went on his phone and he saw a lot of Kila guys running up the Mauna, you know, and the, the whole thing starting to unravel. To protect the, if, for, do they oh, know yeah. what? Oh, the, yeah, so, so, so Lana Kila is one of our um, young, you know, young warriors who was culturally trained and saw the, you know, the day that the telescope, yeah. it, there was an a, yeah. attempt to break ground for the telescopes. And so he went up that time and then again when they attempted to yeah. move yeah. the, um, you know, to do dirt removal and people joined him, you know, he went up all by himself at first, but then people joined him first. One person joined him and then several other people joined him yeah. and pretty soon they had set up a whole uh, encampment of people and that's one of the reasons TMT was never able to break ground. Um, so that, that's, that's who Lana Kila is. Just to yeah, sorry, just so you know. Um, so, and Lana Kila, I think his intention wasn't 
all of what happened, but it just happened, you know? And um, so he told me that he saw that and he knew he needed to go. And he called his boss, who's a Hawaiian man, and he says, boss, did you see what's happening on Mauna Kea? <laughs> and he said, I gotta go, I gotta go, boss. And he just went. And you know, his boss maybe wasn't able to run up the mountain like he was, but he supported him lovingly by not firing him, you know, by understanding and letting him go. So all of the kids have their own private story like this that is so significant. And I, I, I wish someday that we could, uh, you know, set up a recording where we record all of these different stories of how Papa, Earth Mother, called out, you know? So coming here is us kind of weaving the story of the Kia'i that are everywhere in the world together, coming and meeting the other Earth protectors. And I, I, I want to say something about that word because it really took us a long time to shift the paradigm, uh, to have the media even understand and stop calling us protesters. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I can remember the day it actually changed. And we kept saying, no, we're not protesting, we're protecting Mauna Kea. <laughs> we're not protesters, we're protectors. Um, we kept really trying. I kept saying, listen, we're not breaking any law. The law's on our side, by the way. You know, we're not committing civil disobedience, we're committing civil assistance. Because Gandhi and, the, and Martin Luther King taught us through the Industrial Revolution gave us those tools to resist the industrialization of the planet. But we're at this stage now where we're like, we're not protesting, we're protecting. Oh. We're also not waiting. And because it's true, absolutely what they taught us still continues to this day. But what I'm trying to say is we're at a point where we can no longer wait for someone to get it. We need to do it. And what I mean by that also is we need to answer the call of what we need to do. We as Hawaiian people have a kuleana or a responsibility to care for the land and the ocean. And we have to do it. We can't keep waiting and waiting, helping to bring out through us. So I remember the day when the reporter said, the protesters who prefer to be called protectors, <laughs> that's when it shifted, boom, shift. Because we need to carry this idea that we are committing the civil assistance. Because civil assistance means like this. When we, when the Kia'i stood before the enforcement to sacrifice, in fact, they're very willing to sacrifice, even their lives on this planet. But so are the protectors. But more importantly, so is the Earth. You know. So what we're trying to do is change that paradigm, that old paradigm. Even that just because you have money, uh, it allows you to do what you wish to do. Because it doesn't matter if you have money or you don't have money. If we destroy the earth, it really won't matter what your social status is or your economic status at this point. All will suffer. So we're trying to come and um, share our, our story and to raise uh, the standard of aloha, which Everyone always asks me, ask, always asks me, what does that mean, Kelo? And does that mean raise a flag? And it's no, it means to move aloha. Um, because aloha is a state of mind 
but it's also a state. You know, because of the colonial history to stand up and make certain distinctions, the bottom line comes down to is that we need to all be connected through Papa, Earth Mother. And we keep, we keep basically saying, hey, I want to uh, conspire with Earth Mother. I choose her. I don't choose the old structure. It's time for the old structure to go to sleep, to be of our past. Um, it's time also, and, and I, 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 this is a special thing sacred to my heart, um, is to also not only talk about our connection to Earth, but to all of its life, all of the creatures on Earth, because they're speaking to us, and they're trying to reach out and give us information. In Hawaii, we are very connected to the whales, because Hawaii isn't a small nation in a large ocean. We're a large ocean nation, as are all of the Pacific islands, but what connects all of the Pacific is our connection to the whales. Um, and who are the whales? Well, in our creation story, the whales are the ones who ushered, helped sing humans into being. And they are continue to be our messengers. And sa they are sacred beings because they were born and, and came through the time when man was not born. Right, so from the, the great void filled with downloads, all these messages kept coming and coming and images kept coming. Yeah, yeah, close encounters, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, you know, it felt a little like that. But it was really important because that this is like become this voice. Speak these things, you have to share this. You can't keep it for yourself, it has to be shared because others will connect to it. Because what they're reaching out to us and saying is, I see you. And we need to say back, I see you too. I see you and I love you, I aloha you. And thank you for the gifts that they're bringing to us, be it food, be it um, you know, the flowers, uh, the bees, all of these things, all connecting to us. So in the chant of creation, the Kumulipo in Hawaiian, all things mostly were created before man. And then on the eighth day, or not really the eighth day, but it's thousands of years, when man came into the world, they all celebrated, right? Because they, they were all preparing to bring forth man. And when man opened man's eyes, light came into the world. So this tells us that we have an important role to see all of our see and listen and acknowledge them. And I, I know that they will speak to you, however that speak sounds. Sometimes it sounds very much like they're just talking to right at you. And other times it's very quiet, even the plants. So, I'm sorry, I'm probably talking too long. Anyways, I just um, want you to know that that is the, the, our message that we're attempting to bring forward and that we're seeking to connect. Thank not, you. not just with all of you. Thank you so much. But with Papa Mother. And uh, that's what I believe our message is. A lot of it came, and by the way, I saw this morning, the hummingbird. Came to you again. Yeah, yeah, because the hummingbird came I'm here. telling you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she might, she might it's a hummingbird conspiracy. Yes, it is, I it's swear. The, it's the ancestors. Well, I heard the hooty owl first. Who's the, 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 you know the owl that makes the hoo-hoo sound? 
So I went out in the morning. Bill also make a similar sound. So I would oh, fix what? that sound. Okay. Like the owl with the morning doves. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, maybe that's that. The morning doves, yeah, they go. But they do, yeah, they double it up like that. So it's like, oh, yeah. oh. Well, I went outside in my picture, I'm like, I don't know. and I was looking for it. Where is it? Where is it? You know? And it was still dark. But then as the sun came up, I saw the moon and um, I think it's Venus. And then about 50 or 100 crows flying over, and I was like, whoa, where are they going? When I turned back, there was the hummingbird. So, and then this morning, we went out again. And uh, it landed in the tree for a long time. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, they're conspiring with us. Um, I believe it. So anyways, that is all. Thank you for listening and taking the time off to you. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge something that you said. That, you know, um, you know there was there was a Navajo elder um, who's in the spirit world now, Rest is so beyond, that um, I was fortunate enough to be able to do ceremonies with him and, and experience his beautiful spirit. But he traveled the globe. He traveled Mother Earth, and these ancient wisdoms that my my sister's talking about. There's an understanding around Mother Earth with all the ancient cultures that um, is connected. I mean, we had the World Wide Web going on a long time ago, and there's an understanding. It was it, there's an understanding that's known globally as, of all the ancient cultures that, that is so there's more similar than there is difference. Difference, exactly. And the differences are just minor, probably ceremonial ways of doing things. But there was this understanding. You know, he came back and drew it in pictures, and it was like it blew my mind. And I was receiving it at the time, but it was so incredible that it's like. You know, I, I wish he was still here so I could ask him again, but but if someday I'm gonna encounter that somewhere and everything that he taught me will hopefully help flood back in. But there was this understanding, you know, and this understanding is is, is it's back when we were we were connected to Mother Earth, when we were connected to all of our, our relatives, our four legged, our winged our winged relatives, um, our two legged relatives, you know, all, we were all connected, we were all together, we all understood each other, there was a harmony that was of understanding that was going on. There was there was the understanding of you've probably heard the, the term seven you know seven generations. You know um, when the ancient cultures made decisions to do things when they did things they thought about how it was going to affect the next seven generations. You know um, whether they fished in this area and just just kept staying there in this area would you know if they continued this practice or you know, how would this affect their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, their great it was all thought ahead. It was all it was done, you know, from a place of, of, of love for for our descendants, mm -hmm. for our future. And um, and these like my sister here as she's talking about this and connecting with the animals, it's all a part of that. It's all a part about, you know, um, feeling the vibrations of mother and feeling the vibrations of all the animals. The animals understand things, they know things before we do. Yeah. Um, they speak to us. The hummingbird comes and talks to us. You know, um, and there's a hummingbird that comes to my mother and speaks to her all the time, and he just lands right in front of her, and she's like, I don't know what he was saying. Like, well, he understands you, Mom. I mean, there's something you, you probably understand, you know, um, more than you realize, you know, but it's, it's just a beautiful thing that the, the animals communicate with us. They do. They know things that we don't know or that we've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And that it's still inside of all of us. You know, there's knowings in, in, inside of us that's it's, it's deep, it's still there, it's just about unlocking it. And those seven generations looking in that way is how we protect things, it's how we under, you know, it's why we should listen to ancient cultures that have these understandings. We don't have to fully understand why Mauna Kea is so special, such a beautiful place. If the people from there say, say it's so and honor it in that way, we'll understand it at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but to trust them, to trust the people that have been there for thousands of years, and I have a knowledge and an understanding, and we'll receive it at some point. It'll all, you know, it'll all start to make sense. You know, we we know we can affect Mother Earth. We know we can have an impact, whether it's good or bad. Um, you know, you look at the Pacific Gyre Patch, the plastic island that's out in the middle of the ocean. It's 
twice the size of Texas. You know, there's beautiful people that came from Berkeley that are trying to find a way to mitigate that and, and clean that up. But they've done tests on people from all over Mother Earth, and there's polymers in our bodies. You know, we're being affected by it. If we think we're not affecting Mother Earth, and you know, people are, oh, Mother Earth is so big, how can we really impact it? You know, we're just a little species. It's like, no, we can't. We can't. There's mercury in the fish because you know, I had some ancestors that used to work the mines, you know, uh, in the Albanian Quicksilver mines. And that stuff got turned loose, that's in the water, that's why we have mercury in the, in the fish, you know. I, I, um, so, if we think we can't impact, those that think we can't, they're grossly misunderstanding the power that we have in that way. We have the power to, to protect and preserve just as much as we have the power to destroy. And when we destroy, Mother Earth will still be here. She'll still be here, no matter what. She will still be here, she'll adjust. It may not be uh, a habit in, uh, an inhabitant that we can, we can live in and, and survive in anymore, but she'll still be here, she'll have to adjust. So, you know, I don't want to go on, you know, I just really want to acknowledge that, that, that that's, you know, my understanding that when, when Uncle, you know, Leon traveled the world and he came back with that knowledge that was global, that was understood in ancient cultures. It just, you know, just is so much reaffirming that we need to listen to these, these ancient wisdoms, these ancient cultures, and the understandings, understandings that it will help us, you know, to find our way to so that we can exist here with Mother Earth in balance and, and, uh, and not poison it for our grandchildren. Yeah. Not, po not poison it for her children, not mm -hmm. poison it for her grandchildren. We need to look that far ahead. And the decisions that we make right now, it's not about right now. You know? It's about the children. It's about our, our descendants. And I think that that's, that's one of the things that we're, um, we're really build, building the understanding with a lot of different people, you know, the whether it's, you know, of all kinds. And that is where it starts from, is that, you know, we've come to a place in time where none of us are just one thing. We're, we're many things, right? We do so many things. You know, some of them have to do with technology. Some of them have to do with nature. Some of them across different things. We have all kinds of different backgrounds. Myself, uh, my ancestors come from Hawaii, you know, uh, um, from thousands of years. Some of them come from China. Some of them come from Japan. Some of them come from Ireland. You know, there's, those are, you know, so I'm sure that my great, great grandmother in Ireland didn't know that her great great grandchildren would also be the great great grandchildren of someone in China, right? Mm -hmm. Or in Hawaii, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, there's n really no such thing as doing something for just our descendants that do don't, does not affect everyone right and so because we, because because of where we're going and that's the idea that we're having here is how do we all of us you know all of us including the astronomers and including Especially astronomers. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it, you know and including the people who are protecting sacred places and don't want an 18 story building digging two stories into the ground over some of the most precious medicinal waters that are necessary for the continuation of ancient practices that are already threatened mm -hmm. you know how do we build that consensus how do we find a place where we can figure out what can go forward? You know, what can go forward? If the 30 meter telescope cannot go forward, and I think, you know, definitely amongst the 
Kanaka Maoli cultural practitioners of ancient culture, there's pretty much a consensus that the 30 meter telescope cannot and will not go forward, whatever that takes, right? So once, given, given that, right, given that there is, there, there's, there's, there's that feeling, and I mean, and then there's a strong feeling that science is important, astronomy is important, the ability to look at the stars in, mm -hmm. in this scientific way, which is different than our way of looking at the stars. You know, Kealoha talked about the way we look at the stars. It's, you know, we have our own astronomy, we have our own measurements and you know ways that we align things between the planets and between um, different sacred times sites. and yeah sacred sites and 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 all of these things. But how do we come to consensus on what can go forward? You know, and and that's the question I'd like everybody to think about while we play a song. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Sorry for talking too much, but you wanted to hear what you can have. Can we do the kind of thing? Can you go and sing it? I'm going to sing it? Yep. Uh, I'm going to tell you about this song. I thought it was a good time for a song. We have a little, you know, we take a break. So I was in a big island, uh, Kau, and <clears throat> with this really wonderful uh, mother, a young child, who was out in the bushes somewhere, didn't really know why she ended up there. And I was having a great time planting with her and my phone rang, it was a friend from Kauai, who left a message and I, and I, I didn't go to the phone because I was you know, doing some things. And so I took up the phone and I'm, I'm kind of like a 911, you know, and uh, so I get this message. Well, Liko, I just wanted to let you know that now all of the water waves and waterfalls and the rivers and the valleys of Waiale Ali have been all diverted. And then she hangs up the phone. You know, because I when people like it call like that, it's like, okay, either I gotta pack my bag. We went up there, we're going to do something, whatever, got to go to a hearing, we got to da da something. Some kind of medicinal formula is coming. It, sometimes it's good to, uh, very few times that I didn't pick up the phone because I've kind of accepted that that's my role. So Laulani is going to sing this song that the, when I picked up the phone and I listened to it, it just like tears started falling from my eyes and I just, being a, I'm, I'm culturally, I'm known as a hakumeli from very young age. I'm a weaver of words into songs. So I just actually, you know, just this is what I put together and wrote it down in Laulani, fell in love with the song, so she's going to sing the song. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. <laughs>
the struggle that we're in, and I don't know what was covered earlier, but we're in a very, very serious situation, yeah, where people are very ready to put their lives on the line. And we're talking about a lot of people. And if they are brutalized and dragged down, they're ready to go back and do it again. You know, for as many times as it takes, because their genealogy goes to the place that would be destroyed. It was, it's like cutting off your mom's hand. You know, it's not gonna let it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not gonna let it happen, right? So, given that, given that that's where they're coming from, how do we move forward? You know, with the idea, given, let's, 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 give the idea that it's a good thing to be able to see the stars, you know, whether, whether through our ancient ways or through all kinds of awesome technology, you know? But what do we do first to make sure that what one of us does and wants to do and dreams about doing you know, maybe puts our whole lives into doing. How do we make sure that that doesn't hurt somebody else so bad that they cannot exist? Mm -hmm. So the question is open. May I say something? Mm -hmm. I've been listening to, I mean, I get to see Keloha on occasion, some of the other members who were with us over the last couple of days, very disciplined in their you know, approaches. Keloha actually was a trained astronomer. She didn't mention that part. She knows all about the telescopes, you know, where is the mercury leaking, what it really is all about, and all of these things. And me, I'm a songwriter. And the one thing that we come to a place where we have interdisciplinary sciences. Yeah. I went to school at the University of Hawaii, at sort of almost by the end of the Vietnam War. And very quickly, in my first semester, I took astronomy, oceanography, geology biology, geography in my first semester. I don't know why I did it, but I'd always worked in the garden. 
and it gave me an understanding of my geography teacher, I remember at this huge conference at opening day, he says, you know, more wars are started because people don't understand geography. Oh. And I've come to, to understand that what he was saying. And as we came here to the interdisciplinary sciences, sciences, that it was not just about, and as I listened to Kelo and I listened and I hear and I had my own experiences of what is happening, the question came to me was like, why is it happening? And in the, in the disciplines of sciences, one of the reasons why this is happening is because the science of politics as is, it needs to be brought into this, okay? And in the situation in Hawaii, and I will try to cover this as briefly as possible, I was trying to break down, and I don't very often get a chance to include this, and that's why I'm asking. You know, I'm getting like, well, don't talk about it, but it needs to be talked about, because to understand the role of political science Whatever, how you would define politics, people, that uh, if you're missing uh, an element of science that has evolved as much as astronomy and everything, and you, and you are not putting that in, uh, like, you know, you put oil in your car. If you put the wrong oil, you're putting not enough oil, the whole machine starts to run hot. And in the, in the context of the Hawaiian Islands and Mauna Kea, the political issues that have evolved out of, and I'll just say briefly, 126 years of military occupation. Imagine living in a concentration camp surrounded by water for 126 years. And it will give you just an idea of what lives there which is an exploratory, kind of like, you know, uh, it's an exploratory science. Why is it happening? What is there? In my, I'm a songwriter, I'm a gardener, but I was raised in a family whose responsibilities were as public servants. I grew up with them. That includes judges, attorneys. I was the only one that stayed home, didn't go to law school. But I'm okay with that, because I had a guitar and songs. And so I process politics through music. And, but yet I am, and uh, you know, and of course the use of words. In the Hawaiian culture, in the word is life, in the word is also death. Mm -hmm. Leave out one word and you may come up short. Use the wrong one, okay? So in the context of it, just be aware that there's reasons why things are happening. They need to be uh, uh, laced in there. You know, it's like if you try to tie your shoes and you, you forget to put it one over here. All the time your shoes gonna have it, then it's gonna catch on something, you're gonna get hurt. So that's what I wanted to, it's becoming more apparent and important and the, one of the missing links that academically, that university support as we go into the world of people and politics. So that's all I wanted to, to inject into it because it has been briefly touched upon and to me it is so important in the healing process. We, just, we need the right oil for the car. We need the right parts. Okay, okay thank you. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I wish that we had um, a, a lot longer time to 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 um to talk and we will still have time to to discuss but one thing that i want to um i want to cover here because i i do um recognize again thank you so much michael for being here i i really appreciate your being here and actually since you're here i'm you know since we talked about uh getting a letter in the mail i'm kind of wondering if we could ask you to deliver something for us and so but but it's not finished yet so so this is a letter from students of the university of 
California. And, um, but I know you have to go, so what I would like to do is see if, um, if maybe, I don't know, if was, um, maybe a student would probably be best to read this, but in, when we went to Berkeley, people wanted to sign on to it and deliver it to the different astronomy departments. So maybe um, if somebody could, could read this because Mr. Bolte needs to go, and so um, Professor Oldley needs to go, so if you can um, uh, just take a look at anybody who wants to add their name, I want to give them the time to do that, um, and so that he can take it, you know, wait, to it. Um, um, you just need to have someone read it now for him? And then yeah, well, well, I, I, want, I, want, I want somebody to read it now so, yeah, that, okay. so that they can, um, so that people, they can pass it around and then he can take it before so he leaves. So who, who would like to read it? You would. There you go. Okay. okay. I might struggle with some pronunciation. I think it, you'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> Mahalo. Yeah. It's the University of California and University of Hawaii. The 30-meter telescope International Observatory identifies the University of California as one of its full member partners in the construction of the TMT, which will be just the latest telescope built on the sacred summit of Mauna Wakea, otherwise known as Mauna Kea. As a federal environmental impact statement by NASA on the Keck Outrigger telescopes has noted, future activities on the summit of Mauna Kea would continue the substantial adverse impact on cultural resources. In addition to desecrating sacred land of great cultural significance, the TMT clearly breaks state law in its violation of conservation district criteria and represents a large threat to surrounding communities given that it will produce toxic and chemical waste. Thus, we, the undersigned, write with a sense of urgency to demand that the UC divest from the construction of the TMT. The development of the TMT is the latest iteration of a settler colonial project of development and exploitation on Mauna Kea. The first general use permit to build a telescope on Mauna Kea was granted to the University of Hawaii in, eight, in 1968, and the first telescope was built in 1970. In 1983, the Mauna Kea Complex Development Plan was approved by the Hawaii State Government, and from 1983 to 2002, 13 more telescopes were installed. Kanaka Maoli, the indigenous people of Hawaii, were not consulted in this long and gradual process of developing Mauna Kea. In 2010, the TMT was proposed, and in 2015, construction was slated to begin, thereby prompting resistance on Mauna Kea, which led to 23 arrests of Kiai protectors on April 2, 2015. In response to continued assaults on life, land, and sovereignty on both Mauna Kea and Halei Kea, Kanaka Maoli continue to put their bodies on the line against development and desecration. The number of Kanaka Maoli and allies arrested has grown to 91 at the time of this writing. The continued criminalization of Kanaka Maoli and the development of Mauna Kea and other sacred summits land stolen from the Kingdom of Hawaii in an 1893 overthrow and 1898 annexation cannot be removed from a genealogy of violence against Kanaka Maoli and the dispossession of their lands. United States Public Law 103-150, also known as the Apology Resolution and signed by President Bill Clinton in 1993, recognizes the violence done to Kanaka Maoli who never relinquished their lands or sovereignty. The state of Hawaii's administrative rules on conservation districts clearly states that proposed land use will not cause substantial adverse impact to existing natural resources within the surrounding area, community, or region. However, given that the TMT permit application includes tanks for wastewater, the capacity of which is in the thousands of gallons and requires the transport of chemical waste up and down the mountain, the likelihood of spills that will endanger both the natural resources of the mountain as well as the greater community is high. Further, in acknowledging only four sites of impact, the TMT and State of Hawaii de denies the indisputable fact that there are hundreds of historic and traditional cultural sites that exist on the Mauna. It is inexcusable that the University of Hawaii, 
has submitted an application for the conservation district use permit on behalf of the TMT when construction so clearly violates the state's administrative rules, especially since the University of Hawaii is also the designated manager of the Mauna Kea Science Reserve. This conflict of interest cannot be ignored, and it goes without saying that science is not above the law. For these reasons, the TMT cannot be built on Mauna Kea. As the descendants of Ko Hawaii Ae Aina, the Hawaiian Islands, Kanaka Maoli are connected by Mauna Kea to the Aina, the land. Mauna Kea is a Wao Akua, realm of gods, and is sacred to Kanaka Maoli. Thus, Akua, the gods, and Mo'o, guardian spirits, are living residents of the Mauna, residents whose voices resound through the Kiai standing at the front lines. And although Henry Yang of the TMT International Observatory Board of Governors has argued that the TMT would serve as a good steward on the mountain that is inclusive of, Hawa of the Hawaiian community and does its part to contribute to its future through our ongoing, ongoing support of education in Hawaii Island's young people, it is clear that the TMT does not value inclusivity when its construction forecloses the inclusion of a Hawaiian worldview that respects Mauna Kea as a sacred place, a worldview that is key to growing a generation of Kanaka Maoli who are prepared to answer questions of self-determination and decolonization. Moreover, incarcerating Kanaka Maoli youth and those in their communities for defending Mauna Kea stands in stark contrast to the TMT's alleged goal of honoring Hawaiian I Hawaii Island's culture and young people. Neither the TMT nor the UC system can honor Hawaiian culture while destroying the very land upon which Kanaka Maoli descended from, desecrating their kakua and arresting them for pro protecting sacred ancestral lands. We, as members of the UC community, refuse to be made complicit in these crimes through the UC system's participation and financial investment in this violence against Kanaka Maoli on Mauna Kea. As a multi-campus institution that sits on the stolen lands of the Kume Kumeye at UC San Diego, Tongva, UC Los Angeles, UC Irvine, Kahuila, UC Riverside, Patwin, UC Davis, Yokuts, UC Merced, Ama Mutsun and Boloni, UC Santa Cruz, UC San Francisco, and UC Berkeley peoples. The UC system, by virtue of its existence, is already implicated in the violence against indigenous peoples. The impact of this settler colonial violence is only to invest and discontinue its participation in the construction of the TMT and the production of knowledge at the expense of indigenous lands and peoples. Ke aloha aina and then it lists um, Gregory Omaikai Gushiken, who is a graduate student at UC San, San Diego in Ethnic Studies, Nicole K. Furtado, who is a graduate student at UC Riverside in English, and Jessica Aguilar, who's a graduate student at UC San Diego studying literature. Oh, and there's a huge list of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, mahalo, thank you. Can I, can I just add that this is in addition to the uh, 60, 66, or I think it's 67,000. Uh, 66,700 or something. Okay. Uh, something. You know, signatories that signed. Um, A petition to stop the TMT yeah. and and arrest of Kanaka practitioners. Yeah, and practitioners, um, yeah. So that was hand-delivered, the, the, those 60 plus thousand were hand-delivered to the governor, but um, we were sending, sending the links, actually, <laughs> save the tree, <laughs> sending the links to uh, the president of the Gordon Moore Foundation so that he is made aware that there were that many people also who signed and, and, and they were those, those signatures were collected in like four days so it's um you know there's there's a lot of people who are taking a stand um, to protect them yeah for sure so I'm happy to okay mahalo yeah. so what I, what I want to do are 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 you just about at your time when you need to go I am 
Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Real quick, if anybody wants to, um, is interested in signing on, I know there's not a lot of time, but if, um, if anybody does want to, um, I want to just give people the opportunity because, you know, yeah. they, they had the opportunity at Berkeley, so it should be, um, although it was, a, it was very, uh, oh, they, they, the students only got that idea when we were actually there at the astronomy department, so everybody didn't have quite the, um, the same opportunity, but they did ask us to do that, so. Well, so, Lalani, everybody knows where I live. If we would like to do this in a less rushed way, anyone who would like to sign it, they can be delivered to my office at any time. We just pick somebody to make sure that that happens. And then, then you will take it to well, the board? Say, what would you like me to do? Um, we'd, we'd like you to take it to the to the both to the administration here and also to the TMT board as well. I'm happy to do that. Okay, awesome. Um, so, so let's do that, um, and then people can do it at their, you know, people can have a little bit more time. So I apologize to everyone that I can't stay the whole time, particularly to our guests. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll have to um, your history, or in fact the history of our country. Um, I'm an immigrant, and I don't know much about the, the sort of cultural context, but I, I can't speak to science. I, uh, I've spent many years studying astronomy, and, um, and I really appreciate the Earth and its atmosphere, for example. And I just wanted to ask what kind of synergy there can be between um, the natives of Hawaii, what kind of synergy there can exist between that and our quest to understand the universe. Um, for me personally, I speak for myself, I think astronomy is a deeply spiritual process. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, industrialization. And actually the reason why I'm in astronomy is because in my mind it represents the exact opposite of industrialization. It, it represents a sort of a quiet appreciation of nature. Um, it represents stargazing and trying to connect us with, with the universe. And it's something that uh, I personally have found is deeply spiritual for me. And I want to see if there's any way to reconcile these two worldviews. I understand that having a gigantic 18-story white orb on top of your sacred land is a disrespect. But I want to see if there's a way to come up with a mutual understanding where, where we can respect each other's worldviews, each other's understanding of the stars. And, uh, and I want to see if, if, if you guys have interest in uh, the this, this sort of understanding that the TMT may bring. I must, I must say that the TMT is going to be the biggest telescope ever of its kind, and if it is built. And it will, uh, it will deeply uh, expand our view and our understanding. And so I wanted to see if there's any kind of common ground and how we can work together to make a, a more positive world. It's a good question. Yeah, mahalo. And, and, and um, I just want to note that the, your question, it's interesting, your question and my question are pretty close, right? They're, they're, uh, they're pretty close questions. So I think that's, you know, together, those are kind of like the question, right? Like, how, how are we going to do this? Yeah? So um, does... May I offer uh -huh. a little bit? Mm -hmm. Sure. As I listen, yeah, because I'm not an astronomer, I'm kind of a wanderer around the place. And what Pua said yesterday, uh, and what was spoken of at the Moore Foundation, just, I'm just going to be really brief, because, you know, I didn't last too long in astronomy. I failed Algebra 1 twice. So, you know, I just look and, you know, and, and, and appreciate it all, and, you know. But it's like Pua said, and I remember Pua saying, mm. not on that site where it is, where it's designed to be. The site where me, last year, I'm taking up, I used to go up on the mountain, not as that far, the summit. I was taking up there, and I always worked with stones as a child. And I went to the place, the site where it was going to be built, and I 
sat down and I'm looking at the stores. Somebody's hands were over here. These stones didn't just get to be like this, naturally. And looked around and I'm getting all excited and everybody's been, you know, and I just, because I'm a garden. It's on a clear day, see, it's a view plane for us. An absolute view plane that, that it is like a portal, you know. We connect uh, in evolutionary genealogy to the Pleiades. So like a canoe that has a outrigger, okay? And the main Milky Way is like that. In the ancient time, which is still an ancient time, if you can find the marker of time, my kupuna who gave me that prayer, his mother's house in Hanale Valley, the door does not go east and west grid. All of the doors in the ancient world and the entrance to the temples and the portal of time were all aligned with the rising of the Makali, which is the Pleiades, at the time of the solstice and in the time of the harvest time, in October, to October, November, December, and then this alignment. It was a time that marked when the fishes you, you had no one, we don't need to explain why we don't want something mm -hmm. built in our sacred site. I think most people get it. You know, there's universal truths, right, that we were talking about yesterday, that you don't build in burial ground, right? These are universal truths that, you know, cross many cultures. So Malnike is that. It's the burial ground of our highest born and most revered ancestors, such as Hawaii Loa. Right. Um, you know, the, the one who, the navigator who, and chief who discovered Hawaii uh, in that way. Uh, but also, that whole area, the Ring of Shrines, uh, the archaeologists say that the Ring of Shrines on Mauna Kea is, is what, they, what they call a demarcation that identifies what is known as the sacred precinct, which is the summit. Now, since 1968, the summit is pretty much uh, destroyed. Everything's on it. Um, the TMT is so big, though, it would not fit on the summit. So it has to be on the northern plateau. Unfortunately, that northern plateau is exactly what Uncle described, that he can see down the archipelago. So that's where the alignments go to all of the sacred sites along the archipelago, as well as through the Pacific and actually um, around the ring of shrine, I mean the ring of fire of, of the whole Pacific Ocean. It is connected to those sacred places around there too. So. Um, there's that aspect. But more importantly, when we do our Polohiva ceremonies, our solstice and equinox ceremonies, those timekeeper um, ceremonies that keep track of the great, the grand year of the 20, about 26,000 year cycle, the, that is the direction of the movement of the sun from its uh, extreme points, um, going down all the way through Papahanaumokuakea monument, um, monument, but that sacred area, it's connect. Mauna Kea is connected there because some of the islands of Motus there are the northern turnaround of the sun. Right, so those were part of this ceremony that, if built, will obscure that. We cannot do that. So that ceremony will not be able to be done. So these are the kinds of things that are pretty kind of extreme, big deal things. Yeah, and um, when, when the archeologists call and talk about the sacred precinct of Mauna Kea as the summit, that's why it's called Vau Akua, because people, we're not really allowed up there, except for very 
sacred things and in ceremony. So it, it's not the realm of Kanaka. It's not the realm of man. It's the realm of the gods. So it is their house. And so people have this area. The ring of shrines is created from all the people coming up, but respecting the high is and leaving their shrines and their offerings in this ring. It's a huge ring that goes around the entire mountain. So people from all areas come up there and that's where they leave their things and recognize you leave to the gods what belongs to the gods and to man what belongs to man. So, um, so those are some of the, the reasons that we have from a cultural standpoint to not want that to occur up there to, to take all of those things um, away, in other words. So his question is about um, what can, um, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me see if I got it right, right? That, like, how can we go forward, given that, you know, there's this great dream of astronomy. There's no intention to cause harm, you know, in, amongst the, those who have that dream of being able to see the stars and to see ever further out into the universe, right? There's no, there's, the, the intention is not to harm the Earth. Right, but knowing, understanding that this is harmful, how how do how do we go together? What what ways can it go forward and be able to continue that don't cause that harm? Right? Is that the kind of the question? Mm. Yes. Yeah, I was just laying forth. Sorry, just laying forth. But what is there? To, to clarify what is there, and therefore, you know. The, the other thing I want to say from a scientific point of view um, is that modern astronomy is a noble endeavor, but it also has to operate within, can't operate in a vacuum. It has to operate within the context of humanity. And it needs, and I, I personally, uh, after working up there for 12 years. And by the way, as a telescope system specialist, <laughs> which is just a big word for telescope operators, you know. And, um, but after working for 12 years, what, what, what I began to worry about from the scientific point of view was that there is this um, connection to the military industrial complex that is actually a prime motivator of the science behind. It's not looking at black holes, it's not, it's looking at bipolar outflows or any of that. It's looking at the science of the technology that can see those things. And then patenting for the universities, their involvement is about patenting the technology and then selling it. And that's what makes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's creating optics for tanks, mm -hmm. not optics to see. Mm -hmm. But yes, astronomy is like a byproduct, actually. And that was the danger that I began to see. And it was the kupunas from, I work for the British government, so it was those elders from the United Kingdom, those ones who design the telescope and come out. And that's, they're the ones who taught me that because, and, and this is what you need to watch out for, because when you show up at the conferences, why are the generals there? Mm -hmm. Why are the admirals there? Mm -hmm. you, and I was asking that question, like, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why are they here? They care about astronomy? You know, I was kind of being sarcastic, and then later on they said, well, you gotta know. And one of the elders who I really, really respect, he said, we shouldn't get paid in astronomy. I said, well, everyone needs to make a living. And he said, no, no, because the pay is destroying astronomy. The true science of, you know, asking the deeper questions. So what, what, what we have here is the idea that astronomy derives from those deeper question origins. But its moral compass is now a bit challenged because uh, there's industrial, corporate, military involvement 
that 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 affects. I mean, they will tell you hands down there's no military. Fine, fine. There isn't. What there is though is the byproduct, which is the military use, subuse. And Mr. Bolton and I already had this question in the court. We had questions about this. And that's what is the driving force behind those things. And um, I, most astronomers that I have come to know, they're not there to destroy anything. But the, the thing we need to bring back is the moral compass of all kinds of science in the world today because science is, is losing it. Even the health science, it's about money, it's not about health. You, you know, we all know this, right? But how do, what we're trying to do is how do we overcome this? So that's what I just wanted to share with you because, yeah, absolutely. Most astronomers that I've met are, um, they don't want to hurt anybody either. But the, that doesn't change the fact that there will be hurt that we need to think of, right? And, um, and what we told the President of Gordon Moore was that the state itself is not telling the truth because they are arming and they will use this kind of astronomy against the Hawaiian people who are the dirty little secret of the state because they want to deal with us. So TMT is getting set up, not only by the state, you know what I mean, but to, to become the, to look bad. And that's what everyone needs to know, you know what I mean, because you're going to be confronted by peaceful people laying down their body to stop something because they want to stop the harm and the, the state wants to arm and put down the uprising of the Kanaka and um, that's the danger too. Yeah. I've yeah. heard Lana Kila mm -hmm. talk about the whole idea of science and the astronomers questioning the protector's motivations or understanding of what's going on up there, that the protectors are keepers of myths and religion and spirit, but not keepers of science. Right. And that the astronomers are the true scientists. And Lanakila addresses that head on when he says, what makes you think that we Hawaiians who have been, not we, you Hawaiians who have been on the islands for thousands of years, who have observed the mauna, who have observed the, the rains, mm -hmm. um, the flows, et cetera, et cetera, what makes you think that we Hawaiians are not scientists? Right. In our own right. No, no, exactly. As observers of the universe. So I want you to just talk a little bit about that. Well, I just wanted to say, in general, science has to fulfill two criteria, right? It needs to be measurable and repeatable. And clearly, our, you know, ohana va'a, the, the uh, malama honua, the canoes, just repeated our historical journeys circumnavigating the globe without instrumentation by the stars alone. Um, and that, that's an example that what, what our knowledge constitutes and, that, and that's a, the a rising understanding is that there is such a thing as indigenous science because it's measurable, it's repeatable and so what, what um, I think modern science doesn't necessarily recognize that yet but it should because if they're going to gather the indigenous um, under or help, you know, if we're going to help the planet, we're going to have to set it, you know, a, a thousand, thousand years of observation, you know. Um, so we can, we even can have some knowledge that even establishes a, um, a, a baseline, you know, because we need a baseline to be able to see change. And uh, modern science isn't, isn't old enough to understand, even if we've been watching some of this stuff for a long time. You know what I mean? That's it. But I don't know if I answered it. Yeah. 
Uh, just as a point, I'd like to mention that, for example, the, the, the issue of climate change. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's scary, it's ever-present, and it's going to affect island nations much more than, than these big nations that are doing their mm -hmm. part in making it a terrible issue. Um, one of the predictors, one of the things that told us about this is uh, our measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. CO2 over time. And coincidentally, uh, Brian, I think, Brian Keating at UC San Diego, uh, an oceanographer, he had a measurement station on Mauna Kea where they measured the concentration of carbon dioxide very precisely because it just so happens air over there is very well mixed, it's pure. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that we learned about climate change and are able to predict its future and be able to help those who are most in need is through these measurements that were taken on Mauna Kea. And so I see that as, as an incredible synergy of yeah. modern ways of knowing, of, um, of this new science mm -hmm. that is, is helped by the islands and their purity. And so I, I respect your view but I also think that um, there can be these wonderful synergies that tell us so much about our own planet and, and planets elsewhere. Uh, just briefly, um, with all due respect to Professor Bolte, who was here earlier, I just want to, you know, what does it mean to listen? Um, to listen and to say that you respect uh, the position of the Native Hawaiian people, the cultural practitioners, um, when you have no respect for their very clear no, you know, um, and what, you know, and when you're prepared to use the full violence of the the state of Hawaii and uh, the federal government, all the police forces to crush their will, to crush their sovereignty, and the stand that they've clearly taken for years, you know. Um, you know, so what does it mean to listen? And, you know, is that respect? Um, I think if that's your idea of respect, of Santa Cruz to be like, oh, you know, we're listening and we love you, but we're going to, you know, crush you with all the violence of the state uh, while we smile and we're comfortable in our offices, you know, um, and we're getting paid a shit ton of money while. All these people here, you know, put themselves on the line uh, all year round. And, you know, they're barely sleeping, and they don't get paid anything. You know, they're all str they're all just barely struggling to survive, uh, for the most part, um, in their own homeland. Uh, so anyway, you know, I just there's there's no respect for their people. There's no respect for the sovereignty of Hawaiian people. Um, there's no recognition of their no. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think it's outrageous that that's an acceptable position. Mm -hmm. oh. Mahalo. Can I say something? Um, I'm not in the like hard sciences. I'm like archeologist, but I grew up in Hawaii and I'm native Hawaiian. Um. Um, and I, I like love that you guys were here. It like, Mahalo. It, like blows my heart, you know? Um, but I think in academia, we need to start privileging people of color and. Um, their viewpoints and their histories and considered um, as considered real, as considered our realities and lived experiences. And one of the things to do that, and I respect where you're coming from, because as an academic, I'm a grad student. Um, I like, I feel a need to like give back and respect. And like you said earlier, like no means no. And like, we just need to start respecting it and bring more diverse opinions to the field instead of sitting from like, our high chairs saying, well, you know, like, we're in academia, we have the funding and we're going to do it. And indigenous knowledge is knowledge, period, right. and should be taught everywhere. And I think I'm not just only asking for respect, I'm asking for you to respect me and my histories and where I'm coming from. So thank you guys for sharing. Mahalo. Can I um, add something to what, to your question um, about you know, how can we reconcile this? I think that, you know, one of the things, because 
you know, I work with a lot of families that are, you know, looking to reconcile differences and communities that are looking to reconcile differences. And usually the first thing that you have to do is ask, is anyone being harmed? Mm -hmm. You know, and if they're being harmed, you have to stop the harm first and then figure out where you can go together. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that goes for everything from a, um, you know, a housemate situation or a marriage, you know, to a, um, to a world nations, you know. It's taking humanity into, into you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would say that that's kind of like a really basic, a, a, a basic idea just between people of how, you know, if you want to go together without conflict and without war, I mean, not to say that there's not going to be any conflict because even between people that, you know, that are really close, there's conflict and there's struggle. And those, that's real and that's, you know, that that's part of growing, you know, it helps us to grow, all of that. But if that, if it becomes abuse, yeah, and as somebody who does, you know, I do, um, I'm a mediator and a conflict management person. I do traditional ho'oponopono, which is like a, a resolution process. Um, you know, and one thing I can say about conflict, co- conflict is good, you know, it's, 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 it's everywhere. And there's, it's not necessarily, um, th- that struggle is what, what makes a lot of things go forward, you know, and um, but there is a definite difference between conflict and abuse, and once and there has to be a measure where you cross the line from conflict into abuse, you know, and that goes for anything from a date, you know, to. Um, to, uh, you know, any kind of dysfunctional relationship of any kind, you know, whether it's between two people or 10,000 people or a million people, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, it's that, it's, it's that point that what we have to come to consensus on first is where is the line where abuse where something becomes abusive, and if it has crossed into abuse, then we're not in a space of building consensus anymore. We need the abuse to stop, period, end of story. And then let's figure out what the consensus is for how we can move forward to grow together, you know, where this person can develop or this whole science can develop in the best way possible Mm -hmm. you know where this particular thing can you know can go forward in a way that is awesome you know um whatever it is you know i mean we're as people i think one thing that we can say as 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 individuals and as cultures is that we each have a way of manifesting different things that we're here to do, right? And we all have dreams of great things that we want to make happen. And, and as hu- humans, as human beings, it's natural in us to want to help others to, to make their great dreams happen, you know? Um, Unfortunately, what also happens in that picture is that some people's dreams can get so great, and I'm not talking about you know people who want to see stars. I'm talking about people who want to build multinational industries, you know, and have enormous wealth, you know, billions and billions of dollars, right? When, when dreams get that big, they are almost by definition at somebody else's expense yeah. mm-hmm. or a lot of other people's mm-hmm. expense, mm-hmm. right? And what happens is that people who have those kind of dreams will often um, get together 
and form. That's why we have these things like multinational corporations. And you know, TMT is a classic multinational corporation. You know, China, Japan, India, you know, the United States. Um, they're you know they formed a board with a lot of to to pull resources to basically figure out how they're going to smash down an indigenous people and build a telescope you know and um, and so you know that's what that's what a multinational corporation does that's why you have all these different partners that get together to be able to put these things together you know given that a lot of them and a lot of the people in here you know i mean Professor Bolte, you know, I mean, I love that guy. He's like, you're not, he, he's not a billionaire, I don't think. I mean, I, I, I'm sure he's making better money than a lot of us here, but you know, I don't think he's like a, I don't think he's, he's not Mr. Moore, you know? And, you know, I believe him in his simple desire to see the stars. You know, to see more of the stars. And once you see some, you want to see more. And we know that too, as you know, as indigenous peoples who look at stars, you know, we have that same thing. Wow, what else can I see? You know, sure, that that happens. And there could be way there can definitely be ways that we can do it. I can't say how science can do it because I'm not a scientist, you know, and I would not have the technological knowledge to be able to say how science can do that. Just like science and industry cannot say how we as indigenous practitioners can conduct our science. I mean, they've tried in the TMT, in, in this case, they've sure tried to say that. They've tried to say, well, you can go stand over here instead, you know? You can, they, they actually said to Antipua case, you can hold your hand up to block out the telescope from your view. No, I'm not kidding. They said this. <laughs> they, they testified to it in court, and it was accepted. Okay, this is this is how that court case went. All right. They said um, Miss Case has testified that she agrees that she can she could block it out with her hand. So therefore, it's not a problem because she could hold her hand up to block out the TMT and make the view plane, you know, kind of like remember where the view plane was before the telescope was built and, you know, and and still have that view plane, you know. So, I mean, that's the level of what is going on here, right? And um and so, you know, I mean, what I'm saying is they will try to say that how we can conduct our practices, how people with genealogy to the area can adapt to them. You know, they, they, they will say that. And, you know, they're, um, you know, I'm... Can I, yeah. can I say a couple things too? I mean, let's put this in real perspective. Astronomy, doesn't have modern relevance in many ways. The the CO2 question, it's also also many of the scientists who study ice and glaciation because Mauna Kea is a, a place, much of the fossil ice is just below the surface. It used to have three miles worth of glaciers, okay. But the truth of the matter is, is when we look back in time, back in, when we look out to space, we're looking back in time. When we look back in time, something we may see today might have existed 200 million years ago. And when we see it two hours later or three weeks later, it may not exist anymore. But we don't know that because it, it takes light so long to travel. Because the immensity. So the bigger the telescopes, the farther back in time you're going to look. So the oxymoron of all of it is that it doesn't actually have any modern relevance because the farther back we're looking, the farther away it is. But why we're here, compelling here, it, it, our stories to bring here is to compel people to understand that we need, we have an urgent situation now, okay? But 
why I want to say put this in perspective is because exactly what Laulani is saying about the arguments in our court. Our Supreme Court of Hawaii, three branches of government, right? Civics. We went to the Supreme Court. We waited 20 years to get to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court did nothing except for support the TMT and the state action, okay? Why I'm saying they did nothing is because they actually didn't rule on any law. They didn't change a single rule. We could go and start all over again in the lower courts that take three to five years to get to the Supreme Court. Just to hold the project up, and this may happen, is that we would start again our case. Just break our case up into littler pieces. Go in, little thing, right? But how insane is that? That the highest court of the land made the most ridiculous, unlawful decision. And that is the profanity that these kinds of projects are creating in the world. And this is why. It isn't about looking at the stars. It's way beyond that now. Because it is true. It is important to look at the stars and to understand what we're looking at and to do all of those things. Absolutely noble. What is not noble is that it causes the Supreme Court of Hawaii to be so profaned and perverted. Mm. That is the problem that is happening in the world because of power. But what is, see, and what I want to say is that isn't even power. <clears throat> that is not power. Power is the ocean, the wind, the earth. Those oh. are real powers. Mm -hmm these man-made situations need to be better because we can't just keep living with being profaned and desecrated as humans. Mm -hmm. See, the law is like any other form of the logos, right? The logos is any other form of sacred geometry. It too contains the sacred geometry through the logos. <laughs> You cannot have that without. So he made his picture out of a little piece of garbage, but it was there. So it is the goodwill that will make that change. And the thing is, though, is especially the women, you need to know. Don't hold back your voice. Mm -hmm. Because every voice counts to make that change. Because one voice can turn something like that. Turn it around. That's what we call it. Turn it over. And so you must have faith that your voice counts. And that you do mean something. And you are worth it. And everybody needs to join in that and come from that place. Men too, they need to also not be afraid. Don't get stuck in groupthink. Speak your mind mm. and try to create places where it is safe to do that with your friends and your, you know, your colleagues. Demand the safe place to speak truth because, you know, aloha, doesn't exist without truth, right? So truth is the only thing the universe can act on. So we need more of it. And we need to stop listening to, and I don't mean stop listening, but I mean stop listening to the craziness that is really trying to be sold to us all the time and challenge it uh, in a loving way but in a, in a very strong way. Because it's those things that will make the holy, that will make the change we need to, to survive what is going to happen in the future or what is happening now.
Sorry. <laughs> Are there any more um, questions? We probably should like we should probably wrap up pretty soon, but um, but we do want to or, or or any thoughts that anybody wants to share. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of time left, but we you know we do want to hear from from folks. <laughs> Uh, while I truly believe that we should um, love, cherish, honor, and protect sacred land, and I think by doing that, it would be completely dismantling the system rooted in colonialism and disrespect, and we need to reconcile that. In order to do that, um, I personally have been taught, even though through the school is part of that system, an um, incredibly effective tool to get people's attention is divestment and divestment campaigns. And I would encourage, maybe if you have not, I did not hear that you have participated in that, but it can be really powerful in order to get people's attention right. when, as you said, their intention is profit. Mm -hmm. It's a really great way to get Mahalo. Exactly. Thank you for that. You know, actually, actually, we do. We didn't get to that, but we have. Um, we're using the hashtag divest from destruction. And um, we actually... We kind of dropped a little bit of a letter off with um, the chief financial officer of the University of California, Berkeley, yesterday, basically saying, you know, and honestly, I mean, I, I, I don't like to threaten anyone, and I don't see it as a threat, but under this very serious circumstance, we had to let him know that as the financial officer for Berkeley, which is one of the major players in the 30 meter telescope, right, um, is the University of California is very heavily invested in this project that not only are we, you know, are his student, their students speaking to him, uh, but also, you know, we may need to, his donors to speak to him, you know, and the donors of, of all of these universities, we may need to look them up, which we've already started to do, you know, and talk to them. And basically, if, if they won't listen, if the 30 meter telescope, you know, International Observatory LLC will not listen, then, and will not change its current course of direction, then that's why we're speaking here to the University of Santa Cruz, who's a part of it, to the University of Berkeley, who's a part of it, to all of the players who are parts of it. And if they won't listen either, then it is possible that their donors may be the next part because that's where the investment is ultimately coming from, is from the students, from your money that you pay to go to school, and from the people who donate money. You know, and so it's important. I mean, the, you know, I think there are a lot of people who do not agree with this kind of project, but they're funding this kind of project because they have no other choice if they want to get a degree, which is something they need in life. You know, and so. Um, or, or because they want to fund um, education. You know, they have the very noble idea of funding education. They have no idea that their money is actually going to physically brutalize. I mean, bloody brutality is what we've seen. You know, physically brutalize the people who have been connected with a place for thousands of years. Uncle Paul says education is not desecration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning it too because I didn't, we didn't, we didn't bring it up. Yeah, yeah. So, so mahalo for bringing that. <laughs> and is there anyone else? Uh huh. Uh, I just want to thank you for the time you just coming all the way out here to UC Santa Cruz to voice your story. Um, thank you for your mana and your love. Um, 
I know that it's not easy coming here. This type of work is very draining. Um, and I really appreciate your presence, all your presence here. Um, I think one of the questions that I have is, for, for me, for, for a student here at UC Santa Cruz, how do I continue um, being an ally um, for um, the concern with uh, Mon Mauna Kea? Um, how do I better advocate um, for, this, for this situation as a student? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not just a one day event um, here, but how do I continue the relationship mm -hmm. as I continue my education here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Can I give, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just give some suggestions that I think yeah. would be good. Um, you know, so there, there are a number of places where these things are, um, you know, they're visible on the um, on the internet. You know, there's there's protect Mauna Kea dot rocks right now because we something happened with our website. But but yeah, <laughs> <God help it. laughs> but uh, but anyway, you know, there's there there's a protect Mauna Kea website, protect Mauna Kea dot rocks, and it is. Um, you know, there, there's there's information there on how to be involved. There's also a number of places on um, Facebook and other social media, you know, where um, these things are just where you can get updates. Don't look to the news because I'll tell you right now, they have, I mean. They're blacking us out. They're, they're totally blacking us out. And they've been doing that. You know, they'll, they'll rarely release an actual press release show of what's, what's actually happening. Like, you know, we told them about today and, you know, I mean, today is one thing, but yesterday we had a very large presence, you know, doing a, some major things. And, um, there was consensus amongst the news channels not to cover it. So, you know, don't look at the news is what I'm saying, but do look at the news between people because there are, the information is still out there. And you can find it if you, um, you know, by, by looking at people are doing like live streaming video or um, they're, they're showing, um, what's going on, events like this, asking questions. And also there's, um, you know, like uh, as, as Richie was, was saying, you know, the indigenous peoples of all lands, you know, the, over the entire world, which we all are a part of, you know, however it is that we connect back into that. Um, it's like a World Wide Web, you know, and the peoples of the peoples here pretty much will be connected to us and so by checking in with the people in one place you can pretty much find out what's going on yeah. with other people all over the place because we do keep tabs of each other you know or we try to you know i may not know exactly what's happening in olone land or what's happening in tonga but i you know, know I, yeah but but, but I, i'm gonna keep kind of i'm gonna keep my eye out for yeah, it yeah. you know i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it up and be kind of if something doesn't look right it's kind of like hey what's going on you know or you know wherever wherever it may be in um you know whether it's up up in the um up where the the sami you know up in the north of europe or whether it's the you know people all over we kind of keep track of each other a little bit you know that not, not perfectly but we kind of do so by tying into the people who are in the area that you're in it helps to connect to the other um the other things and then when the time comes that you can do something that is a great thing whether it's just sharing something sharing a petition on social media or whether it's writing a letter and we can use a lot of letters you know those really do count making a making a phone call you know um there's there are so so many things to do or organizing other students that's like kind of like the, the really you know great thing or or taking existing organizations and adding you know these kinds of issues to what they do and what they're aware of 
um, bringing it forward to discussions in, you know, in scientific communities, in overall um, pictures, you know, in, in other discussions. There, there, there are many, many different things that all help. These things, they, they may seem like a little thing, and you know, no, no one of us by ourselves is going to be able to stop anything, but many of us doing many different things can make things right. Mm -hmm. Also, um, sharing the story with your, fa your family, your friends, um, we're, we want to build a, a global network of earth protectors, everyone taking their place on any level and all levels, you know, is helpful. And also, don't forget, um, if you pray, pray with us um, because we really can feel it. Um, we can feel it um, every time. Um, whenever we will send out, you know, prayers up, everybody. You'll see Auntie Pua, prayers up, gang, you know. It's time. And every time, um, it really helps because we're praying for the healing of the earth. So all of those prayers really make a difference. And mahalo for asking. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so mahalo again, everybody, for 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 being here, being a part of this, and um, you know, and and for sharing your your thoughts, your manao, and for you know, and um, and for all that that. that you're all doing. I can already see that there's just a lot of potential here. I mean, if you just look in this room at what people have shared, you know, there's there's so much potential. You know, once we all bring it all together, you know, mm. that's what it's really about. Oh. It's about building something, a future for for even more generations to come that will be awesome and that they can do their dreams and you know and make amazing things happen and you know and do arts and sciences and humanity and ask big questions and get some answers and make mistakes in a way that's really good for them and the continuation from there on so thank you everyone <laughs>